Ever since I can remember, it takes around a year when a new console generation launches for it to hit its stride. And believe it or not, the PS5 and Xbox series of systems are around a year old now. That came around pretty fast, didn't it? In that year though, we have had some standout titles, not just demonstrating the technical powers of the machine, but also, well, they've been pretty damn fun. Let me know down below what your favourite games have been over this past year or so. Going into this generation though, we were promised numerous enhancements over the PS4 and Xbox One. Major uplifts in CPU performance, of course, hardware-based ray tracing and other uh, graphical features, and the mechanical drives in the previous generation were being thrown out the window, and instead they were replaced by SSDs, which should improve things such as load times and also provide a opportunity for games developers to throw in huge amounts of graphical detail. There's been a very interesting video which has been uploaded to Wired's official YouTube channel. In this video, Mark Cerny, the lead architect of the PlayStation 5, details some of the technical aspects of the console. Unfortunately, he doesn't get quite into the nitty gritty aspects of the system as I'd have liked, but still, there were some very interesting things he did disclose, and we're going to be discussing them, as you probably guessed, in this very video. But first, just a quick word from this video's sponsor. If you're running a copy of Windows 10, which isn't activated, of course, not only do you have to worry about the missing customization options, but there's also that annoying Windows desktop watermark reminding you to activate. Today's video is sponsored by WhoKeys.com, and they have an excellent price on Windows 10 Professional, as well as Home Keys. Yeah, and they also, of course, sell games. I've bought a few Windows 10 keys with my own personal account to test everything was legit and worked in preparation for this sponsored video. You can pick up one of their keys for 25% off using the coupon code RGT in the checkout. There's links to their website in the video description. Also, if you're building a few systems, there's bundles available too. Again, you can check out whokeys.com and use the coupon code RGT for 25% off the listed Windows 10 key prices. Since Sony in particular were pushing SSDs for their next generation consoles, it's not really a surprise that Cerny decided to start out there. The SSD in both the PlayStation 5 as well as the Xbox series of systems is a huge uplift in performance compared to what we had with the previous generation. Sony and Microsoft have proven a lot of folks wrong because a lot of people did believe that an SSD would do little other than to improve loading times. I put out a couple of videos back um, before the consoles launched, one of them discussing both consoles and the second focusing on Microsoft's direct storage, particularly how it would affect PCs going forward. Just a quick brief history for you guys on consoles, we'll be ignoring things like tape media, which old retro 8-bit computers use, such as the Commodore 64, and squarely focusing on consoles such as the NES onwards. Firstly, we had cartridges. Cartridges had nice benefits. The first is that data was very quickly accessed, and many NES and SNES games could be outfitted with helper chips. The SNES, well, the most famous chip being the Super FX chip. The problem, of course, with cartridges is that they had limited data storage, and Nintendo famously used cartridge technology for the N64. This did mean that games like Mario 64 and Zelda were possible. Arguably, those titles would have needed to have been designed very differently if they were on a CD-based format because of access times for the CD. Basically, with a CD, you could house up to 700 megabytes of data, and most consoles at the time had just a couple of megabytes, such as the PlayStation 1, of RAM. So this meant that you could have a very rich library of data, music, and other storage housed on a CD, but cartridges were basically the reverse. They had super fast access times, but an N64 cartridge was 4 to 64 megabytes, 64 megabytes being the maximum that an N64 could support. Games like Resident Evil 2 first released on the PlayStation 1, but when they released on the N64, they had to undergo a huge amount of compression, particularly because of the FMV, which had to be heavily re-encoded. And this, of course, was to fit on the maximum cartridge size of the N64, again, just 64 megabytes. Fast forward a few generations and games were now on Blu-rays, but data retrieval was hideously slow. The PlayStation 4's Blu-ray drive, for example, topped out at just 27 megabytes per second. And if you do the math on this on how long it will take the PlayStation 4's memory to fill up, it's going to take a while. 
So, of course, to combat this and a host of other benefits to boot, Sony and Microsoft outfitted their consoles with a hard drive. Yes, technically, Microsoft even outfitted the original Xbox with a hard drive, but let's ignore that for these examples. Depending on the angle, though, of the sun and the moon, and if you remember to give your PlayStation 4 a back rub, maximum transfer speeds of the hard drive are around 100 megabytes per second. Now, that's much faster than 27 of the Blu-ray, but it's still not amazing. One of the reasons though that the speed was variable, as I mentioned about the angle of the sun and the moon, is because if you had a ton of smaller files, they would actually load a lot slower because of seek times. Basically this is where the mechanical head would, well, seek the data as it's spinning on the disk. Cerny then reveals that originally developers had approached Sony asking for a rather modest target for the SSD, just one gigabyte per second. And that's 10 times faster than the PlayStation 4. But remember, you would also have no seek times of this because, well, it's an SSD. Cerny proudly points out that they did not want to achieve that target, but rather they were aiming for a five or 10 times uh, this request from developers. Using decompression, they actually did achieve over a five times target. We'll get more into that in a moment. Ultimately, the PlayStation 5's SSD then offers 5.5 gigabytes per second of raw data throughput. That's pretty fast. There's a 12-channel interface where the various NAND chips are plonked onto the board, and then PCIe lanes connect them to the PlayStation 5's SOC. Data is sent to the SOC, which can then be decompressed on the fly, and thrown, a technical term, into system memory. Now, this is important because filling in the PlayStation 5's main RAM, which is 16 gigabytes in total, not including OS reserves, can therefore be done in just a few seconds. Further to this, it means that data can be thought of as transitionary, or to put it another way, developers can commit to a wider number of textures, especially higher resolution ones, and, well, they know that they can replace those textures or other assets very quickly. So, for example, let's say you're playing a racing game and you're hurtling around the track really fast. You only need data resident in the console's memory for up to a specific section of the track. Other parts of the track which aren't close to you could simply be unloaded, and new data for the upcoming section could be loaded in. You can also think of doing this in a first-person shooter. If you enter room A, then go to room B, and then C, data for room A could already start to be unloaded, because they know that by the time that you even turn around to do a 180, you could have already pulled in two, three, or four gigabytes, let alone by the time you've actually gone back from room C to room A. Now, just to be clear, data streaming is not new, but being able to do so so fast, that is definitely new. Cerny mentions that uh, Sony aimed for a strategy called integrated I.O. Basically, this is where the compression work for developers is essentially hands-off. Developers provide the code, the game code, to Sony's publishing tools, and then the tools take care of things on their behalf. Decompression, too, is invisible, where there's actual decompression blocks built into the PlayStation 5's SOC. Developers don't need to code directly to this block and provide it instructions on how to perform specific tasks. Decompression blocks are present on both Sony and Microsoft's hardware, of course, and simply take the workload which would otherwise be accomplished on a CPU and shunt it to this custom silicon. Now, if Microsoft or Sony had not outfitted the Xbox or PlayStation with this specific silicon, you would have needed to have dedicated several Zen 2 cores, depending on the console, the number would vary slightly, and this obviously was not efficient, either in terms of power or area efficiency. So again, going with the custom silicon route is smart. Sony points to Subnautica as one example of how a compression can be a big win. This shrinks from 14 gigabytes on the PlayStation 4, which isn't a huge game by any means, to just four gigabytes on the PlayStation 5. Control goes from 50 gigabytes on the PlayStation 4 to half of that on the PlayStation 5. And Spooderman on the PlayStation 5, despite having higher quality assets and textures over the PS4 version, actually weighs in a little smaller as well. In essence here, we have a situation where the data can be read from the SSD at a much greater level of compression, and then decompressed using this custom block. We've seen a lot about specific types of decompression uh, previously, such as how Sony is pushing Rad Games Tools set of software for free 
uh, to PlayStation 5 developers. As an aside, by the way, they've actually been purchased, uh, that is Rad Games Tools, not Sony, by Epic Games. Again, all of this is an effort for data throughput. The PlayStation 5's design, including um, the faster clock frequencies of the GPU, de uh, decisions on the caches, and so on and so on and so on, were all designed to get data from point A to B as quickly as possible. Switching our focus load to the CPU, AMD provided their IP here with a Zen 2 based CPU. Microsoft and Jaguar for the previous generation also used AMD, opting to use AMD's Jaguar processor cores. Jaguar was an x86 based instruction design, and well, it formed a pretty large departure from the PowerPC-based architectures, which were the basis of the Cell, which was the CPU inside the PlayStation 3, and Xeon for the Xbox 360. Speaking briefly on the Cell for the PS3, I've actually covered this in a really old video. If I get time, I might actually redo it. Let me know what you think, guys. Do you want me to do that? The Cell was basically designed, though, around a single processor core, and it was capable of executing two threads, so SMT, technically. This power processing element also formed the basis of the Xbox 360's Xeon, albeit with a few changes, not least of which is Microsoft went with a tri-core design. Therefore, it was capable of six threads. Sony's cell, though, was very different. They added SPEs, or Synergistic Processing Elements. You've got to love the name for that. There were eight total for the broader implementation of Cell. However, for the PlayStation 3, Sony opted to disable one. So I presume this is for yield reasons, but yeah, the PlayStation 3 was already kind of expensive to manufacture. The SPEs did not have branch prediction and could in many ways be thought of as the precursors to GPU compute. Each SPE had six ex execution units and could run a whole bunch of stuff on them. This stuff, which is very technical, includes things like physics simulation and AI, along with other things like graphics tasks. Unfortunately, the cell inside the PlayStation 3 was notoriously difficult to develop for, as it was an in-order processor. Thus meaning that careful programming was of course important, but so was the compiler. Random instructions could be the devil which would stab your performance in the shin with a pitchfork. And to complicate matters further still, the SPEs were hard to fully use. So unlike the Xbox 360, where at the very least you could use all three processor cores quite damn easily, with the PlayStation 3, this meant that a lot of third parties just basically ignored the SPEs and essentially had one CPU core to work with. Because again, the tools from Sony weren't exactly the best, developers weren't that used to the uh, system, and to make things even more complicated, flexible memory of the PlayStation 3, well, it wasn't flexible. It was a non-unified memory system, and yeah, uh, Microsoft just had an easy implementation of the Xbox 360. It's not to say the 360 was better, but it was a lot easier for developers to get their head around, and I think, you know, we've started to see what games like... Um, uh, the original or rather Uncharted 2 and Last of Us and some other games could really do on the system. Uh, was, PlayStation 3 was really powerful. It just took a long time to really start to leverage it. Anyway, I'm digressing from the script a bit here. The landscape changed significantly as Sony and Microsoft released their new consoles, the PS4 and Xbox One. The companies this time chose to go with AMD to provide both the GPU and CPU in the form of a SOC. This is basically a combination of various silicon in one. The problem here though was that the Jaguar, which was the CPU, was not particularly powerful. The PlayStation 4 CPU clock was just 1.6 GHz. IPC, instructions per clock, well it wasn't the best. These CPUs were designed around things like tablets, they were not exactly designed around high performance computing. So these uh, eight CPU cores were present, but six and a half of them were available to games developers. It used to initially just be six, but then Microsoft, I believe, freed up some of the seventh core first, and then Sony followed suit. Either way, though, Jaguar did have some benefits. 
not least of which it was 000, or out of order CPU. Now that doesn't mean it doesn't work, it just means that instructions don't necessarily have to be, you know, carefully compiled. They can kind of approach the CPU at different in different orders and it makes it a lot easier for games developers and it also means that you're a lot less reliant on the compiler itself. Also, while the CPU was kind of weedy, you could also shift a lot of the work to the console's GPU. This was in form of compute instructions. The Zen 2 cores inside the PlayStation 5 are a huge leap in performance, though, over what we have with uh, Jaguar. Zen 2 debuted for the PC in the form of the Ryzen uh, 3000 series, and Sony and Microsoft well, they went with Zen 2, despite Zen 3 available now for PC, because of bring-up times for the consoles. It was honestly just a perfect fit. Eight CPU cores to house inside the system, and running up to 3.5 GHz. Interestingly, Cerny mentions that developers asked more than eight. Actually, they were asking for 16 cores, but Cerny and Sony, and I assume Microsoft probably would have had a similar discussion with uh, developers as well for the Xbox, but I'm speculating. They basically pointed out that this would lead to cuts in GPU performance. There's multiple reasons behind this. One, CPU cores do take up a reasonable amount of die space, but the second thing is that, well, heat and power consumption are a thing, so you would have needed to make some concessions, of course, for the GPU. The larger the chip, the more costly it is to produce, not just because you can fit fewer uh, chips on a specific wafer. TSMC's 7nm processor is what's used to produce the 308mm squared sock inside the PlayStation 5, but you're also increasing the chances of defective dies. Remember, there's a reason that for the PlayStation 5, there's 40 compute units and 36 are enabled, so four can be you know damaged without needing to chuck away the chip and for microsoft it's um, 52 are enabled and 56 are present so again they also have a bit of wiggle room as well so sony basically would need to have cut back on either gpu clocks or the number of compute units to stay within power budgets and this is a kind of a big thing the clock frequency of the playstation 5's cpu and gpu are variable with the road to ps5 event Sony had said that a drop in power of about 10% of the GPU affects uh, frequency of the GPU by a few percent. This is actually a variant of an implementation of AMD's Smart Shift and doesn't rely on heat as a mechanism to dictate performance because that could differ depending on environmental factors. So for example, if you're running in a summer, then obviously heat could be higher and so on and so on. It's also worth noting that uh, power not affecting GPU uh, speeds linearly is nothing new. In fact, quite frequently for PC gamers, well, we undervolt GPUs all of the time, both for AMD's uh, GPUs and even CPUs. Often even Ryzen CPUs are undervolted, particularly if you want to overclock, which is perhaps going to raise some eyebrows to people who are not so familiar with it. But yeah, undervolting Ryzen CPUs is a thing, especially if you're pushing PBO, precision boost overdrive speeds. But again, I am digressing. In short, in most situations, according to Mark Cerny, the GPU and CPU of the PlayStation 5 will retain their maximum clock frequency, but if a heavy workload hits, say, the processor, the GPU may dip its clock frequency a little. This could be for less than a frame of animation, just a few milliseconds. Now, based on some SOC photos we've seen and a number of other leaks, and bear in mind we are definitely not in official disclosure territory here, although I have covered some of this on the channel previously, it's likely that Sony have made quite a number of tweaks to the PlayStation 5's Zen 2 variant including some cuts and some other enhancements. We'll get into the cuts first. One of the big cuts is that they seem to have snipped the floating point operation or the FPU of the CPU. Now, I've gone into this more extensively in another video, so I'd recommend you check that out. I'll try to remember to link it in the description of this one. But what is almost certainly the case is that Sony believe that those type of operations would be best to be ran on the GPU in form of compute or other custom silicon blocks. We've actually seen a very interesting series of benchmarks and these were compiled by Nemes 
and this was from the Ryzen 47, uh, 4700S, excuse me. That's basically a SOC, which was essentially a defective PS5 die with numerous components disabled, such as the GPU. And we can see from the benchmarks here that integer results are basically on par with Zen 2 for the desktop, but heavy AVX instructions basically dive off of a cliff. Again, this is definitely intentional. What you should be aware of with these benchmarks is while they're interesting from a technical perspective, Sony do not believe that developers will code titles like this. These are PC benchmarks. Basically, if a developer was crafting a game for the PS5, and that's ultimately what the PS5 is, a, a games console, they would either take advantage of specific accelerators on the PS5, such as, say, decompression blocks, or they will shift work to the GPU in form of compute. Now, there is almost certainly other tweaks in the PS5's CPU, uh, such as enhancement to the caches, which I've discussed again on the channel before. This would include, almost certainly based on die shots and other leaks, that the CPU and GPU would better share information. Now, it doesn't have a unified cache, or infinity cache, just to be clear here, but it does almost certainly have an evolution of what we've seen with the PS4's, you know, design. And this, again, can help in various ways. But I don't want to get too much involved in this because, quite frankly, it's falling definitely outside of official information. And uh, because of that, I don't want to bog down the video with too much, you know, rumors and stuff because I want this to mostly focus on what Merck Sony said. Sony also mentions that while other silicon, such as the GPU, um, are there and, you know, of course, are extremely important, they all get their smarts from the CPU. In other words, the CPU is responsible for running the show. The GPU, for example, gets issued instructions by the CPU in many cases, such as, say, a draw call to, well, draw something. Next, we have, well, the GPU. Sony basically continued their journey with AMD, with 36 compute units, the same number as the PlayStation 4 Pro, but massively increased the clock frequency and went with a much newer architecture. Largely, it's based on RDNA 2, thus having features like hardware-based ray tracing. We'll talk more about that one in a moment. A very interesting thing with this discussion with Wired, though, is Cerny did not get drawn into specifics of GPU features for the PlayStation 5 or capabilities, but did mention that the console had a custom cutting edge feature set. And further to this zeroed in that Nanite for the PlayStation 5 was a big inspiration. I've already gone into great deal of discussion with uh, Nanite, Lumen, and Unreal Engine 5 in general previously, but in a nutshell, Nanite allows developers to pull in huge quality assets directly from something like ZBrush or Maya, and then as the camera or character moves closer, detail can seamlessly be pulled in, or lower polygon counts can be uh, adjusted depending on your distance from the camera or the object. This provides developers who use Unreal Engine 5 a ton of flexibility. If you want a very long form yet informal conversation about this, I was also tapping into the brains of Intel's Bob Duffy on a podcast. I'll try to remember to link that in the description. If not, you can simply search Bob Duffy on the channel. Of course, Unreal Engine 5 will run just perfectly on the Xbox Series X and PC, but it's interesting that Cerny heavily implies that Epic were a rather large force in the development of the PlayStation 5. This is something I said back in the day actually on the channel, that Epic were a big mover. We know the PlayStation 5 does not support mesh shaders, which is in the Xbox Series X and Series S version of RDNA 2. Remember though, that a feature is not the same thing as an architecture. For example, neither the PlayStation 5 or uh, Xbox Series S or X have infinity cache but this does not mean that the console is not RDNA 2. From what I've gathered and what Sony have said in public, it does seem that PlayStation 5 was specifically designed around RDNA performance with custom features really revolving around the implementation of the geometry engine inside the system. I've mentioned before that I believe the PlayStation 5 chip was started first with Bring Up before the Xbox as Microsoft had to go with the PC implementation of RDNA 2 as they wanted an easy port between Xbox and PC code as this works very well for them in the SDKs. I actually believe 
believe the RDNA 2 was probably delayed for its bring up as well. I can't go too much into that though in this video because it's already getting really lengthy. Sony though, and this is a part guess, partly what I've been told under the table and partly what they've said in public, almost certainly had custom designed the geometry engine and other components around the very notion of gaming. The geometry engine does allow developers to simply leave it be. And of course, this means that it can largely kind of handle things itself and issue instructions to the GPU, or developers can get in and code directly to it using a variation of AMD's primitive shaders. Prim shaders and mesh shaders are largely quite similar in the way they do things. The problem is, though, we don't specifically know what changes Sony added into the geometry engine, including what they changed for AMD's implementation of primitive shaders, which were first found in Vega. Although, honestly, to say they were found in Vega is not exactly saying much because, well, Vega didn't really get them working too well. Either way, one of the big customizations I've been told that's part of the geometry engine is for it to be able to handle two viewports very seamlessly. This would be for the PlayStation 5's virtual reality, of course, but all in all, it's a very interesting piece of conversation. I think really, rather than discussing the PlayStation 5's GPU, if you really want to know what the console is capable of, we need to know more about the geometry engine, and Sony have not really said super amounts about it. Either way, next up is ray tracing. Ray tracing was brought up by Cerny, and perhaps this is most interesting of all because they were not actually asked by developers to include real-time ray tracing as a feature for the console, and this is because they did not believe, that is of course console uh, games developers, that it would be possible to do real-time ray tracing on a console level device. Ray tracing basically simulates how light and shadows can act in a world by essentially sending out rays which bounce from a surface to a surface to a surface and these bounces allow the GPU to figure out what reflections will affect what surface. As an aside, by the way, ray tracing is not just for visuals. You can even do ray tracing for AI, and you can also do ray tracing for things like audio. I've actually spoken to NVIDIA about this, and I've also spoken to um, a couple other folks on podcasts previously. Uh, there's a really great interview with Neil Trevor, who works at NVIDIA, and he's also one of the heads of uh, the Kronos Group. And I believe I speak to him quite a bit about that, as well as mesh shaders uh, and their specific implementations. You can check out my video on that. I believe it was the last uh, podcast with Neil Trevor, so you could check it out um, in, of course, on the channel, excuse me. But a very simple way to visualize ray tracing and kind of what it does and these multiple bounces, let's say you have a mirror and in front of the mirror is a can of cola. Now, I'm going to really shock you here, but the cola would of course be reflected in the mirror. But let's say that you added a second mirror and it's angled to the first. This would mean you would have a reflection of the first mirror in the second mirror, but depending on your angle, you might also see a direct reflection of the can of cola. This means that you are basically getting a secondary reflection. Now, in reality, it's way more complicated than this, as reflections could be anything from infamous rain puddles to door handles to, let's say, sweat on a character's skin. It could reflect light. There's so much stuff that uh, happens with ray tracing. It's really mathematically intensive. Now, Sony and uh, Microsoft basically used the AMD RDNA 2 implementation. We actually saw a patent for this quite early on. It was published, um, and I actually leaked back in March 2019 that RDNA 2 would have ray tracing. But AMD's implementation is a bit different to NVIDIA's, though. They use TMUs, that is AMD, uh, to basically pull double duty. So the texture mapping units essentially can also perform the duty of, well, mapping textures, but also creating ray triangle intersection testing. I've had a pretty in-depth discussion regarding ray tracing actually from the NVIDIA perspective as well with NVIDIA's new new subtil. Hopefully I have, that, uh, have pronounced that correctly. This was early on in the RTX 20s lifespan. And again, I've discussed it with Neil Trevor as well, but if you are interested in ray tracing and going into it a lot more in depth, you can go and check those videos out. 
Either way, I think it's fascinating that Cerny says that in his mind, games have had really two eras and now we're entering the third. The first era were games like Sonic, Mario on the Super Nintendo, or whatever. 2D sprite based games, in other words. 3D games then came along. These are polygons and they stole the show. Games like Mario 64, Halo, Crash Bandicoot, and so on and so on. These games allowed you to adventure, explore, and really were, you know, a lot deeper in what you could actually experience. However, those games did have limitations. Often the visual effects you could kind of see problems with them. They were easy to poke holes in. You had HBAO, screen space reflections, and so on and so on. SSR, screen space reflections. Well, if you've ever looked at a game in like a puddle or whatever, and noticed that if you kind of pan your camera down, a building will start to disappear, this is because you're using, or well, it's using something like SSR. Basically, the object itself is essentially disappearing because it's no longer in screen space. Basically, the the viewport or your camera or your character's eyes however you want to think of it it starts to cull an object when you're not looking at it to save gpu resources but this means that an object which is being reflected uh, in screen space using ssr is no longer able to reflect that object because it's basically only able to reflect something which is well part of the scene and obviously if it's culled out it's no longer part of the scene you guys get what i mean so the problem is it no longer exists so what does this mean well ray tracing you know if you're running ray tracing it doesn't suddenly mean that the entire game world is rendered at all times because clearly that just would not be yeah it just wouldn't be possible so what we have now is basically a thing where um, the game world basically has a description of all the different assets and objects and you know characters and all of that jazz it's all held in system memory and then basically, uh, the GPU can run uh, BVH, bounding volume hierarchy uh, calculations, to figure out if a specific uh, ray of light will intersect with a triangle, um, which is within you know your viewport. So basically, it calculates things from your viewport. Anything that you are able to see, it tries to figure out whether a um, specific object is going to interact with an object which is within your you know scene of which within your uh, viewpoint it's very complicated and mathematically intensive almost all games now use hybrid ray tracing um so stuff like spider man uh, spider man on the playstation 5 or whatever a lot of games use hybrid ray tracing and this is basically a mixture of older graphics techniques uh, rasterized graphics and then conventional light and shadow is either augmented or outright replaced depending on performance requirements with ray tracing there are some fully ray traced games quake 2 for example uh, seen an rtx implementation and uh, obviously this was pushed by nvidia i believe it runs just fine on amd though but i can't remember exactly i haven't tested it either way point being that um it's well, it doesn't look as good as a modern-day game, to be honest with you, but it's a great proof of concept of, you know, what we could do if we had a ton more GPU resources. Now, you can also see here one of the limitations of ray tracing, and that is noise. Basically, even the most powerful of GPUs, you still cannot throw enough rays in the scene to not have it look like a noisy mess. So you use something like denoising to fix this. It's also used in regular hybrid ray trace games as well. So that's one of the reasons I decided to throw it in here. Also, certainly mentions the uh, Tempest uh, engine. And obviously, this is essentially the PlayStation 5's audio component. He doesn't really add much that hasn't been said a few times previously. Essentially, it seems to be a modified compute unit. And obviously, compute units are really good at complicated maths. And one of the things that they were trying to do with the PlayStation 5 is highly positional audio. So obviously, um, raindrops, for example, can be layered on top of other uh, sound effects. So you can kind of have a feeling of actually immersion in the game. So basically, from what I understand, uh, from what Sony have said here, there's no caches. It's basically directly accessing system memory. Um, and yeah, the PlayStation 5's audio components are actually really impressive. And it's going to be very interesting to see how developers leverage them going forward.
So there you have it guys, lots of technical information regarding the PlayStation 5. I really do hope that Sony does a more in-depth disclosure of the system at some point, as there are a ton of technical details regarding the console that honestly Sony haven't disclosed. As I mentioned, things which particularly interest me concern, for example, what the geometry engine in the system is capable of. But as it is, until either a game developer breaks NDA or we get a disclosure similar to what we saw with like GDC, um, you know, coverage with uh, the PlayStation 4 back in the day where developers were disclosing, for example, the particle systems of Infamous and so on and so on. Yeah, I, I suspect that we're going to be waiting a while. It is a little frustrating because I just kind of want to know just because, well, it interests me more than anything. But... I suspect that this generation of consoles has a ton of potential. At the end of the day, there is a lot of efficiency still left to wrangle out of the machines, of course, and at the end of the day as well, we're still just really touching the iceberg of what next generation game engines like UE5 are capable of on these next generation consoles. It's going to be a fascinating next couple of years, I feel, and yeah, I, I am glad though that these next gen consoles have launched, mostly as a PC gamer, because I do think that it's going to be spurring major enhancements to PC games as well. At the end of the day, you know, we have had things like SSDs on PC for a long time, and technically you can actually buy faster NVMe solutions on a PC than what's available even on the PS5. The problem is, uh, software at the moment is just simply not able to really take advantage of the SSD when it comes to games. This is how things like direct storage are really going to start to benefit the PC. Um, you know, but we've talked about a lot of stuff in this video already, and uh, hopefully you have enjoyed it. If you did, then you know what to do, of course. Leave a likey on the video, and of course, subscribe to the channel if you're not already. And I will see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Have an amazing day. Bye for now.